Ladies and gentlemen, how are you all doing? Welcome to Logan for Liberty. I'm coming at you from the Pacific Northwest, where the sun shines so bright, only to rain a couple hours later. Today, I have some fantastic news that I can't wait to bring you. Um, we're going to talk about your Second Amendment rights, and we're going to talk about an amazing story that happened yesterday on uh, Tuesday. Um, it's good news. It opens a lot of doors for some amazing possibilities. And then I'm going to basically solidify the fact that your Second Amendment rights will never be taken away. And I am going to list you two, uh, let's see, yeah, two different statistics that, and, and reading articles, they're, they're kind of old, but they really just, they should make you feel good. Today is going to be a podcast about optimism. And if you if this is your first time joining us, thank you for joining. Don't forget to hit the like button or subscribe or check out the other podcasts. This is podcast number eight. So officially, I am going to have a podcast every Tuesday. Today is Wednesday, um, but my, my work schedule, my full-time job is changing a little bit. And it'll be a lot easier for me to have podcasts every Tuesday and that's what I'm going to strive to do um, that's my goal and so there's going to be one every Tuesday and what I will probably do is if I can fit one in I'll probably maybe have one on Monday even Wednesday or Thursday or Friday there's no guarantees but there is a guaranteed podcast from here on out every single Tuesday I would have had one yesterday I uh, I don't really have a big enough uh, audience yet for it to really matter but um I had to do overtime I, I did a 10-hour shift on Monday which is typically I, I work four tens usually but this week I worked five tens I usually get Monday Tuesday and Wednesday off but I had to work Monday because we had some big wigs coming in so we needed our production to be up a little bit and I had to go in, which is fine. I, I like some overtime. I could do five tens every every other day, or every other week. <laughs> five tens every other day. Yeah, that would suck. So I got some overtime, ten hours of overtime. Not only that, but you know, it, it's whatever. But I was so tired because my schedule it's like in between swing and graveyard, so I didn't wake up in time for Tuesday and. By then, there was a bunch of stuff that I had to do. So, it, just, it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. So, I'm doing it right now, here on Wednesday. But, expect a podcast every Tuesday for those of you who are, for those of you who are here, who are listening. Every Tuesday, from here on out, we will talk about something. I'll either talk about recent news, or I'll come up with a topic. It totally depends on my mood, what I feel passionate about that week. And today, we're going to talk about the Second Amendment, mostly. Let's see, I, I have a stack of, oh, sorry about that noise, I have a stack of stories, um, I could probably fit this one in, I'm not sure, um, probably my next podcast I will talk about socialism, because why wouldn't I talk about socialism, or I guess uh, I'll talk about how socialism is falling once more, and how the free market and private property prevails. So, as I said, if you are new to this show, to this podcast, this podcast, it's obviously mine, named after me, Logan. So, it's not necessarily a libertarian or conservative podcast, it's the podcast reflects my opinions, and I just so happen to be a libertarian. And... But again, that doesn't make it a libertarian podcast, despite the fact that it's called Logan for Liberty. If I become a socialist, it'll be called Logan for Theft, um, Logan for Abolition of Private Property, which probably won't happen, because once you go full libertarian, you don't go back. Well, for the most part. But I have my worldview. I, I, I see the world through a prism of my principles. That's how uh, I'd say quite a few people, that's how quite a few people operate within our plane of existence. And then there are other people who take it 
by an issue by issue basis. And then there's other people who have no morals, who have no principles. And they don't necessarily take it issue by issue because even people who take it issue by issue have principles. It's just they can be persuaded from one way or another. But I have principles and I found these principles going through issue by issue about things that I care about. And then what I have perceived, you know, everything I've experienced, that I've read, that I've perceived has shaped my views has, has shaped the pyramid or the, the prism that I see the world through. Therefore, I now hold these principles. And I think that these principles are key to almost every situation or issue that we come across. And just to start out, um, Jason Stapleton, if you don't know who that is, he is the host of the Jason Stapleton program. He is a libertarian. He's a trader in the stock market. Uh, he has Trading Titans as one of his business. I, I, I don't specifically remember the businesses that he actually has. But uh, he's a great guy. You should listen to him. He, he's not a real exciting, explosive type of speaker. He's just he's a confident, intelligent speaker who knows so much about the market that it, he him alone, just finding his podcast... And listening to it the last couple of months, I have learned so much. And maybe I could talk to you about some of what I've learned from him. Right now, I'm going through the book Liberty Defined by Ron Paul. Uh, if you ask Ben Shapiro, by the way, I'm a fan of Ben Shapiro. If you ask him, <laughs> uh, Liberty Defined is, has uh, sections where it's anti-Semitic. Not true. Whatever. That that's I'm going on a tangent. So let me just talk to you about my principles real quick. I will probably do a video where I talk more in detail about these principles and why I feel like they are important. But the first principle, the first five are principles that I acquired from Jason Stapleton listening to him. Well, I, I had them before. They were things I believed in, but I didn't really have them as my core principles. And now I do. I, I did before, but now I've been able to identify that they're my core principles. Um, and that is individualism, free markets, tolerance, peace, and limited government. And then also natural law the scientific method, and decentralization. Those are my eight principles that I hold on to. And uh, you can call me a, a libertarian. You can call me a liberalist, Sargon of Akkad style. You can call me classical liberal. You can call me a Jeffersonian classical liberal or Jeffersonian Democratic Republican or Jeffersonian Republican. You can call me a Madisonian for James Madison, you can call me a constitutional conservative, Rand Paul style, or you can call me a, a liberty conservative, libertarian constitutionalist, it doesn't matter. I have ideas that are founded upon individualism, free markets, tolerance, peace, limited government, natural law, scientific method, and decentralization. So without further ado, let's get started. The very good news regarding our Second Amendment rights, the Ninth Circuit. <clears throat> Has, has held or holds by a two-to-one vote that the Second Amendment secures a right to carry guns openly in public places. Though the Ninth Circuit had earlier resolved Peruta versus County of San Diego in Bonds that the Second Amendment doesn't secure a right to concealed carry, unfortunately, but a lot of states are adopting a concealed constitutional carry Sort of, sort of law, but this, the, regardless, this is still amazing. As uh, D.C. versus Heller had suggested, in reliance on the 19th century cases that had generally rejected a right to concealed carry, the panel concludes, also citing Heller and 19th century sources, that there is a right to open carry, so as to be able to defend oneself in public places as well. The Supreme Court has stated that carrying can be banned in some sensitive places, such as schools and government buildings. So any right to carry would not be unlimited, but it would apply to carrying a gun in one's car on most streets and the like. The court also leaves open the possibility that the underlying right is just a right to some form of carry, so that the state may choose whether to allow open carry or concealed carry or both, of course, but may not ban both and thus makes guns available to most citizens for self-defense in public places. 
It is, of course, quite possible that the case will be reheard in bonds, which is what happened with Peruta, where the panel decision came out in favor of protecting a right to carry. But if the case isn't reheard in bonds, or the panel decision is affirmed in bonds uh, rehearing, then the case may well go up to the Supreme Court, since this decision reinforces a split as one of... I, I can't... I can't talk. No, oh, sorry, not, not, uh, not one of the judges. Um, the reporter of the story. Anyway, so this opens up the door for, so I, I don't know if you know who Austin Peterson is, but he is a libertarian. Some libertarians have disowned him because he decided to run as a Republican for, for Senator in Kansas or no, sorry, Missouri. I said Kansas cause Kansas city, but Kansas city, there's Kansas city, Missouri. And then there's Kansas city, Kansas. Regardless, um, Austin Peterson, if you've ever heard him, he talks about how we need to stop compromising on the Second Amendment and we need to start pushing back. He said uh, he does support uh, common sense gun reform or common sense gun legislation. And he would support the National Se uh, Hearing Safety Act, which would make silencers easier to get to protect people's hearings. That's the type of Second Amendment advocate he is. And... It, it kind of, when I heard that, I was like, yeah, you know what? We should be unapologetically Second Amendment. Now, I'm not saying that we should rub it in people's faces. I think we should definitely try to convert people instead of trying to win arguments to allow people to support the Second Amendment. You don't even have to convince people to like guns. You just need to convince them to like the Second Amendment. But when I heard Austin Peterson say this, that we need to push back on the Second Amendment because... We've lost every single liberty that we have lost through a battle of inches. So it's time for us to start going on the offense instead of the defense. Because we're always going on the defense. We're like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, we can do a background check. But just don't, don't, no waiting periods. And then what happens because we conceded the background check? Well, a few months later or even a few years later, we get waiting periods. Or, um, yeah, yeah, no, no. Okay, we can have a permit to carry. Just don't, don't keep me from open carrying. Which is what happened to my state. Now we can't even open carry in uh, our city of Portland without a concealed carry permit. It just it, it goes against logic because it's a CHL concealed handgun license, but you can't open carry without one. So you cede some territory, and then they take the rest. Basically, they're starting at an uphill battle. They're battling us uphill, but we're ceding territory. And we think when we get over the top, like, we can see territory to them and we get over the top. And since we went over the top, we're now going back the other side of the hill. It's sort of like a peak. We hit the peak of the hill and because that's where we gave, we gave up territory. So now they're bringing us down. So now we're facing an uphill battle. That's what's happening with uh, some of our battles when it comes to the Second Amendment, when it comes to the rest of our liberties. When uh, A great example of this is hate speech or freedom of speech. You go, oh no, yeah, I support free speech. Oh, what about hate speech? Uh, yeah, that probably shouldn't be accepted. You ceded territory in that case. And unfortunately, this is something that a lot of people have done, which has gotten us to the point where we are now. Or somebody shuts, shuts down your event or you get ridiculed and you're ceding the territory because now there's nobody to fight back against the onslaught of our freedom of speech. They're trying to dismantle the foundations of liberty that has set up this democratic republic. Even if you don't believe in a democratic republic, even if you're an anarcho-capitalist, it's still a culture that is tearing down the foundations that we believe in. <clears throat> Freedom of speech, the second amendment. And then <laughs> we've, we have, we have turned the other way to them spying on us by going, oh, well, you know, I have nothing to hide. So now the government has been able to spy on you for all these years. Edward Snowden is in Russia right now. He can't come back to the United States because he revealed that this government agency was illegally spying on us after they told us, no, we're not spying on you. But Edward Snowden is somehow a traitor and he's treasonous, which is just amazing to me. <clears throat> I don't, I don't want to seem negative. 
I'm a positive person. I'm, I'm just really passionate about this. I'm passionate about all of our liberties. And to talk about another liberty that we have, it's the right to a fair trial. It's uh, one of the most basic structures of a system that is based upon rule of law. It is uh, um, due process. We have a right to a trial. But on college campuses, if you're accused of sexual assault or rape, you can lose your privileges to visit the campus. You can be socially ostracized. And there's some politicians and even some professors and college students that want the police to arrest you. Now listen, I, I think anybody who does any sort of sexual assault or rape should be arrested. I think they should be punished to the fullest extent of the law. But with that being said, we need due process so we can assure that we are not locking up innocent people. And I don't believe in a, a court of public opinion. I don't believe that public opinion should weigh, should determine the outcome of how the law is held or, or whether or not we determine somebody is guilty or innocent, which seems to be a path that we're going down or we're straight up punishing people. And the radical, uh, I'm not going to say feminist as in the definition of feminist because uh, Christina Hoff Summers, I think she is the pinnacle of feminism or she is the savior of feminism in my opinion. But feminism, feminism nowadays when we talk about it, when anti-feminists talk about it, we're not referring to equal rights under the law. We're not talking about rule of law, classical liberal ideas. We're referring to the left-wing postmodernist sort of, uh, I don't know, neo-Marxist types of people. The egalitarian feminists. You know, where, where they want the government to come in and start giving people special privileges so they can be equal, which is, which is terrible because it's group think instead of individualism. Different people... That's a whole conversation we can go into, but that's the way we're going. All right, so let's move on. I'm going on a tangent, stuttering a lot. It doesn't matter. Americans own 46% of the world's 1 billion guns, says the UN report. I don't even have to say anything anymore. Basically, that title, it just done. There's nothing else I have to say. But if, I, I want to read the article because there's uh, some interesting things in there that I want to talk about, which is, uh, in my opinion, really exciting. Or really cool. Or uh, another that just signifies that for us Second Amendment advocates, we have won. There's no other way around it. So, the United States is the land of the free and the home of the brave. We all know this. We're also a nation that cherishes gun ownership and our Second Amendment rights, guaranteed under the Constitution. Right now, as with with any mass shooting, those rights are under attack by the political left. All of these shootings are horrific, but chipping away at the rights of law-abiding citizenry for the sake of safety is unwise and dangerous. I want to talk about something real quick. I hate it when... I don't hate it, but... If we're trying to convince the left that we're law-abiding citizens, therefore we shouldn't have our rights taken away, I find that that argument doesn't always work. It's not because we're not law-abiding citizens. It's because if the left ever got their way and they outlawed guns or they put more gun legislation down, that would make us law-abiding citizens no longer law-abiding citizens if we resisted. They typically hold that against us. Because there's something that we have to realize about people that advocate for gun control. And then I'm not going to call them the left in this specific example. But these people who advocate for gun control, they advocate for laws that restrict certain parts of your freedom. Or that restrict certain actions or certain things that you're able to do. Therefore, to them, if they pass that law democratically or from their elected representatives, then it's... They don't consider you law-abiding. They will consider you criminals. This is the position of radical gun control advocates. They won't see you as a law-abiding citizen. That is something that I think we need to write down and we need to store in our memory because that's the way they view us. So when we're talking to somebody who thinks that gun control is necessary or if you're trying to convince them, using the word law-abiding isn't going to sway them. <clears throat> or sway them. 
It's always been that way. Sandy Hook was a heinous crime, but no new legislation to curtail our rights occurred. The anti-gun left went for the Hail Mary and failed. Now they've focused... Now they're focusing? No. That's a typo. Now they're focusing on local legislative goals. The push for universal background checks is no longer a focus. It's increasing the age for purchasing firearms, uh, Vermont and Florida, which has Republican pro-NRA governors caved in, caved on this front. Wow, this article has a lot of typos. And they're gaining legislative wins. But while the left's... But while the left's their ultimate... Wow. Somebody needs to go through this. This is from townhall.com. This is amazing. Somebody needs to go through this article. Uh, but while the left's their ultimate goal is to repeal the Second Amendment and confiscate firearms, reality might upend that grand scheme. We all know there are over 300 million firearms owned in the U.S. To enact laws to fully take all of them would need policies seen in brutal authoritarian regimes. According to a small arms survey, there are over 1 billion firearms in the world. Sorry, firearms in worldwide circulation. And Americans own 393 million of them. That's 46% via Time Magazine. So, let's just put this in perspective. That's 46% of the world's firearms that Americans own. And there's another article that explains uh, how quickly we went from like 30% to 40%. This is just amazing to me and I love this. I love this. <clears throat> there are over 1 billion firearms in the world today including 80 857 million in civilian hands, with American men and women the dominant owners, according to a study released Monday. The small arms survey says 393 million of the civilian held firearms, 46%, are the United States are in the United States, which is more than those held by civilians in other top 25 countries combined. The key to the United States, of course, is its unique gun culture. The report's author, Aaron Karp, said at a news conference, American civilians buy an average of 14 million new firearms every year. And that means the United States is an overwhelming presence on civilian markets. The report said the numbers include legal and illegal firearms in civilian hands, ranging from improvised, improvised craft weapons to factory-made handguns, rifles, shotguns, and in some countries, even machine guns. Oh, there's a story that I should have printed out so I could have talked about it. Guns that are being printed. 3D printed guns. And, uh, completely legal. Completely legal. Simply because of the fact... Oh, by the way, these are these are what we'd call ghost guns. They're illegal because it's freedom of speech. Because basically what they're doing is, is you can share information over the internet. Uh, diagrams, uh, um, basically blueprints on how to make a firearm and then you could use those blueprints to have a 3d printer make a firearm it's a great new world and listen I'm not afraid of firearms even even if the most hardened criminal could get a 3d printer print a gun he still has to go buy ammo and even if that happens it's such a rarity despite what anti-second amendment advocates like to say the world is violent in some places and in some little pockets in the United States. It's violent and it always will be. But for the vast majority of Americans, it's rare that you will ever die from being shot. In a civilized society like we have, violence is rare. Unless it's justified. So I'm not afraid. I'm optimistic. I... Guns are an important part of American culture. And that's the thing about American culture is we're, we're called violent. Americans are violent, right? And to an extent, yeah, for a, a, a post-industrial nation, we are pretty violent. But those numbers are heavily skewed because of these pockets of poverty and gang violence. And those always get included in those numbers. And here's something amazing about gun crime. It's less than 1% of the entire population. It's less than half of a percent of the entire population that dies from a gunshot. And most of these gunshots that people die from, more than half of them, 
are from suicides and self-defense. Which is an even smaller percentage of people that die from gunshots where there's actual malice involved. <clears throat> so I want to talk about um, the Obama administration and the effect that it had on guns. For those of you who were alive back then, you know that people bought a lot of guns under Obama. Because a lot of people were afraid that Obama was going to take their second amendment right away. Um, I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I think if... Here's what I think. I think Obama would have pushed a lot of more gun legislation. If... I think he would... Okay, so... Typically, a smart president or a smart person who wants to be president twice... Who wants two terms. They're not going to do their most radical positions. They're not going to uphold their most radical promises. Or let you know their most radical position in their first term. Especially when they want to be re-elected. Because they know that if they are elected their first term. And then they start enacting gun legislation. Not only will you have the NRA and the gun owners of America, the Jewish gun owners, and so on and so forth, armed mothers, whatever gun rights advocates group, and there's a lot of them that are out there, they will rally the voter base and they will vote them out, which is why gun control will never get past anything beyond a state level, which is delegated to just a few states where there's actual gun control that affects your Second Amendment rights. California, New York, Massachusetts, um, Florida is inching towards that direction. But for the most part, you will be voted out. So when Obama became president for the second time, when, when he uh, was elected for a second term, after two years in the midterms, Republicans took back Congress. Because it was a way to rally you, you defend your Second Amendment. Once you talk about taking away people's Second Amendment rights, people come out and vote in self-defense. So let's go on with this article. Okay, now there's no denying it. President Obama, the Democratic Party, the liberal media, and other members of the progressive left are the best gun sales team of the decade. Yesterday, Fox News Los Angeles correspondent William La... Juanes? Juanes? Junies? I don't know how to pronounce that name. Told colleague Martha McCallum that since President Obama took office, over 100 million guns have been bought by Americans nationwide. He added, Americans are not just putting these in their closet waiting for a burglar. They're taking classes, getting permits to protect themselves. And in the previous article, if you remember, it stated that over four Americans are buying... Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? 14 million new firearms every year. Okay. Uh, that's a lot. And in, uh, under the Obama administration, it's been over 100 million firearms that have been sold because, well, people were afraid that Obama would take away their Second Amendment rights. And uh, he probably would have if he could have. Last week, Christine wrote that the number of background checks ran by the FBI on Black Friday reached a record of 185,345. As for gun production, it's increased by 140% under the Obama presidency. So, <laughs> under the Obama presidency, we increased production, which is fantastic for the economy. Uh, the more we produce, the better the economy does. And uh, because they were afraid that Obama was going to take away their Second Amendment, Second Amendment rights, we increased production, created jobs, we created a product for consumers. Um, as for concealed carry permits, John Lott of the Crime Prevention Center released a study in July showing that they've increased 270% for women and 156% for men since 2007. So all across the board we have seen an increase in concealed carry permits. And I want I want to compare the number between men and women. 
For men, it increased by 156%, concealed carry did since 2007. But for women, it increased by 270%. That is amazing, in my opinion. Every feminist should see that number. They should see the number of women that have increased their bill or that have acquired a concealed carry permit, and they should celebrate. But these radical feminists, they're anti-gun. They're egalitarian, postmodern, neo-Marxist types of people. So, therefore, they're not going to celebrate that. That is amazing. I am not afraid of a woman arming themselves. I think it's... I feel safer with women arming themselves. I wish my freaking... I wish my mom would buy a firearm to protect herself when she goes out. I wish... Any woman close to me in my life would carry a firearm, at least a 380 ACP, just for just for protection, for simple protection. It this is, I, I I hope when my nieces get older that they carry a firearm. Most likely, my brother they they'll grow up around firearms because of my brother. He's he's a good dad, and um he's you know a firearm enthusiast in a way. I support this. I think the more women who are armed, kind of, I think the more responsible, uh, able-bodied women who are armed, the better our society is. You want to talk about rape prevention, uh, sexual assault prevention? If you're if you're a piece of shit, so, sorry for the language. If you're a piece of crap, who goes out and assaults women or wants to rape a woman. I hope he gets shot. And you're probably going to think twice if you know that a majority of women are packing heat. Let's continue. There's also evidence that permit holding by minorities is increasing more than twice as fast for whites. Again, this is amazing. This is something that the left should applaud. I support minorities carrying firearms. Because... Unfortunately, a lot of minor minorities are stuck in slums where there's a lot of gang violence. They need a means of self-defense if they can't escape a slum. They need a means of self-defense. I support this 100%. And if there is a rampant amount of white supremacy, as radical leftists would have you think, then what's the problem with a minority defending himself against a cloaked KKK member <laughs> which uh, or a, a goose-stepping Nazi? This is the world that we're led to believe. So yeah, if, if this is the world that actually exists, arm yourselves. But this isn't the world that exists. This is just a minority of people that are racist, that have, for some reason, ceded power or uh, acquired power because the election of Donald Trump. It doesn't make sense to me. But, uh, whatever. Let's continue. In Chicago, the areas with the most carry permits are predominantly black and Hispanic neighborhoods. As for women, a lot of attention has been devoted to their increased participation in shooting and gun ownership. Across the country, women have been taking the proper courses to obtain their carry permits. At the same time, violent crime has never been lower, which is a point that President Obama said law enforcement should be proud when he addressed the international uh, Association of Chiefs of Police in October. Listen, I have no doubt that maybe police played a part in this. But another part in this is uh, gun ownership. Okay? Criminals, if they're unsure that somebody has a firearm, chances are they're going to rethink their decisions before they go and commit a crime. Which basically means as more, more neighborhoods are armed with responsible gun owners, crime is becomes even more concentrated and less common, at least violent crime, maybe even some extent a property crime. He also said he isn't looking to take anyone's guns away. Every time a mass shooting happens, one of the saddest ironies is suddenly the purchase of guns and ammunition jumps up because folks are scared into thinking that Obama's going to use this as an excuse to take away our Second Amendment rights. Nobody's doing that, the president said. So this is kind of an old article, and uh, I think it was right when the election was kicking off Obama. Somebody asked Obama about his guns or something like that, and he basically got up and said people are afraid that I'm going to take their guns away or have accused me 
of wanting to take their guns away. But the truth is that more guns have been bought under my presidency than ever before. And there's a reason before that. There's 100% reason for that. It's because we know that you are an anti-gun advocate. After San Bernardino, Obama got up and said that this was because this person had easy access to guns. It's not a figment of our imagination. We know you're anti-gun. This isn't something that the NRA is telling me. I have never been a member of the NRA. Ever. I've never been a dues-paying member of the NRA. Ever. It doesn't take a freaking brain chemist or brain surgeon to know that you were anti-gun and that if you had your choice, if Republicans didn't take over the freaking Senate and the House, or at least the House, the last two years of a presidency, we probably would have seen more gun legislation. This is insane to... I, I know I snapped. And I'm not even... I'm not a shill for Republicans either. I think Republicans are just as much of cowards and just as much a socialistic as uh, their Democratic counterpoints. Counterparts. Uh, <clears throat> author noted that the spike in firearm sales is unrelated to crime sprees since everyone is expecting their Second Amendment rights. Then again, it's true that firearm and ammunition sales usually go through the roof under this presidency after mass shootings because anti-gun liberals want to do just that, eviscerate the Second Amendment. This is true. And if you're listening to this right now, we've had the Parkland shooting. And guess what happened after the Parkland shooting? The media and politicians exploited high school students who are not yet 18 to push their anti-gun agenda. And they purposefully chose ones who were not 18 yet. Because how dare you criticize a 17 year old? How dare you? That's what these people do. They use any pawn that they can to push their agenda. And listen, the right does it too. I'm not stupid. Yeah, the, the, anytime there's a black person who's a gun owner or anytime there's a high school student like Kyle who, who believes in the second amendment, we prop them up. I'm not unaware of this. I know this. Both sides do it, but in the case of the Second Amendment, the left is doing it. And then the right has done it in defense. Coleon Noyer. No, no, Noyer? He's actually a pretty good gun advocate, though. I could see why the NRA gave him a show. Um, you should listen to his podcast on the Joe Rogan Experience. It's an amazing podcast. He makes a great pragmatic case that can convince almost any gun advocate, anti-gun advocate to maybe rethink their position. I'm sorry I kind of ranted there and I sounded like I was whining or complaining. That's not, I guess that is who I am. I'm optimistic though. It's just some things, they they, uh, they get my goat and they make me kind of explode. At least I'm not exploding Alex Jones style, so there is a little bit of redemption for me in that, in that sense, I guess. Listen, uh... I'm just, I'm really passionate about this. I guess uh, I'm not going to finish, I'm not going to be able to throw in this story. I'm really passionate about things that I believe in. And one of the things that I believe in is the Second Amendment. I believe in self-defense. I believe in your right to own property. I believe in your right to own a firearm, which falls under both of those. You should be able to defend yourself either against domestic or uh, foreign threats. Um... One of the best things that you can do is to preserve your life, your family, your property, your liberty. And that's why I support the Second Amendment. It has nothing to do with hating children, as uh, some radical leftists would suggest. It has nothing to do with having a small penis and I feel insecure. It has nothing to do with me not being a man. You know, not, not me being able to defend myself as a man. Because why should you have to defend yourself? Going, you know, with the with the man to man, you know, the fisticuffs. Why should you have to if you're not willing to? If I'm walking down the street and some dude wants to come and they want to fight me or mug me and steal all my money, I'm not gonna throw down with them. Why the fuck should I have? Sorry, I'm cussing. Why in the world should I have to throw down to defend myself? 
a man doesn't need to throw down with somebody when defending himself. There are some who are capable of doing that. That's fine. Go for it. The only time men should fight fist to fist, you know, mano to mano, is when it's a consensual fight that they both agree on. That's different. If I'm walking down the street and some guy comes up to me and tries to mug me, I'm sorry, I'm not concerned about being manly. I'm concerned about protecting my life, liberty, and property. My property being my body. My property being any sort of valuable possession, including currency, that I have on me. Which is also the fruits of my labor, which is created through my property, the exertion of force through my property that acquires currency. My life. I have a right to protect that. Unless I want to go and maybe do euthanasia or assisted suicide. That's that's a whole other conversation. Uh, I went dark. And my freedom to travel unhindered, unabridged, with, without coercion used against me. My, tr my ability to travel from point A to point B, whether it's for business or leisure. My, my liberty to defend my life, to defend my property. That, that's, there's no reason why, oh, sorry, that, it's just that, I don't know if any of you have ever heard that argument being made, that people who own guns aren't manly, you know, because they're afraid to be a man, you know, they can't fight man to man, it's like, yeah, no, sorry, not if you're mugging me, if, if, a gun is one of the greatest equalizers ever, and we're not on an equal footing, you don't have the high ground if you're attempting to mug me. And then there's this idea that us gun owners are paranoid. That's so bizarre that people would... You're paranoid. Therefore, you know, you should really open your eyes and get rid of your paranoia. So you can accept the fact that we want to take away a crucial right that you have. Okay, so what if I'm paranoid? Whose business is that? It's not yours. And me wanting to defend my life and my, my liberty and my property... What does that have to do with paranoia? It's just an equalizer. If you have a fire extinguisher in your house, is it because you're paranoid of a fire? Yeah, you probably are paranoid of a fire. I'm paranoid of somebody harming me. It's not because I think society is violent. Just like I don't have a fire extinguisher within a walking distance, not even walking distance. I could reach my arm out and grab a fire extinguisher if I really wanted to. I could force grab that fire extinguisher. That's how close it is to me. It's not because I'm, I'm paranoid of fires everywhere, because fires, statistically, in a lifetime, are kind of rare. It's a safe measure. It's a, it's a safe fail. The left should understand this because they advocate for social safety nets. It's a social safety net between me and a fire. <laughs> or between me and a burglar. It's the greatest equalizer. I don't know if I really had a point to anything I was saying. I think I was just ranting about stupid I, stupid arguments. Um, So, I might do another podcast for tomorrow. If not, it'll come Tuesday. If I don't end up doing a podcast, what I will probably do is I will probably make individual videos. Um, One thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about the new Ron Paul. Um, Of course, that's not literal, um, I think there's other people that take up the mantle of Ron Paul, but there's a very principled, liberty-minded person, um, in Georgia as a state representative that, uh, I hope eventually makes his way up to the federal level. We're going to talk about Trump's tariffs and how much of a disaster they are, and we're also going to talk about, uh, the fall of socialism, especially in Cuba, and we're going to talk about the rise of private property in free markets, which might be a little bit of an overstatement, but it's a little glimmer of hope. You have listened to Logan for Liberty. I hope you all have a good one. Peace out. Oh, um, before I go, though, I should really work on my introductions. I have my introductions down pretty good. I need to work on my outroductions. Um... Links to my Facebook and Twitter will be in the description box below. Links to my other podcasts will also be in the description box below. 
Um, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you do subscribe, hit the notification bell so you can be notified of any future videos that I upload. Um, I promise the podcasts will get better. I will get a hold of my marbles in the future. Peace out. Have a good one. Stay safe.